What event marked the Silurian period? Remember, our journey began in the Ediacaran, the third and final period of the Neoproterozoic, and thus the Precambrian. Since then, we've traveled a long way through time, spanning many millions of years. We began the Paleozoic with the Cambrian, then moved on to the Ordovician, which succeeded it. Now it's time to learn more about the Silurian. This third stage in the history of the Paleozoic promises to be just as rich in discoveries. Unlike its predecessors, the Silurian period is relatively short, around 25 million years. In fact, it's the shortest of all the Paleozoic eras. Other eras, such as the Cambrian, lasted nearly 56 million years, and the Ordovician, the period preceding the Silurian, lasted nearly 42 million years. The Devonian, which followed, lasted almost 57 million years. If geologists have differentiated the Silurian period from the Ordovician and Devonian, it's because it's sufficiently singular to be so. And that's exactly what we're going to discover on this trip. The Silurian is a pivotal period in our history, marked by numerous changes in flora and fauna. During our trip to Cambrian lands, we witnessed what scientists call the explosion of life on Earth. During the Ordovician period, the radiation of organisms was just as rich, allowing numerous species to develop and diversify. In biology, radiation is the adaptation of an animal or plant lineage to a new living environment, resulting in modifications that facilitate their activities. This is sometimes referred to as adaptive radiation or evolutionary radiation. While the Cambrian and Ordovician periods were pivotal in terms of radiation, they were far from the only ones. The Silurian, on the other hand, was a crucial period for life on our planet. It was the period that forever marked the face of the Earth, with the arrival of the first terrestrial organisms. What was the Earth like at this point in our history? How are our continents and oceans defined? What living beings populated the oceans? How did life evolve? And why did life begin its conquest to the Earth's soil precisely at this time? Dear Traveler, welcome. Today we're continuing our journey back in time to over 400 million years ago to discover the Silurian. Until then, life was almost exclusively aquatic. We'll see how biological evolution and climatic and geological changes helped fauna and flora begin to conquer the land. Let's go back to the very beginning of our history, several tens of millions of years after the Cambrian explosion, just after the Ordovician, now over 440 million years ago. Let's go back to the dawn of what was the Silurian, the third Paleozoic period. But before you set off on a new adventure, remember to like the video and subscribe to the channel. Thank you, and have a great trip! The name of this geological era comes from the Celtic tribe of Silurians who lived in South Wales, where traces of this period were discovered. As mentioned in the introduction, the Silurian is a small period, spanning some 25 million years. It began around 443 million years ago and ended around 418 million years ago. This period, the third stage of the Paleozoic, 
is itself subdivided into four series marked by different events that geologists have defined as follows. The first, called Landovery, or Landoverian, begins 443 million years ago and ends around 433, followed by the Wenlock, or Wenlockian, until 427, then Ludlow, or Ludlowian, until 423, and finally, the Predoli, or Predolian closes the period between 423 and 419 or 416 million years ago, depending on estimates. As you can see from this reproduction of the image of the Earth in Silurian times, the continents Laurentia, Baltica, and Siberia are still isolated from each other. They formed a gigantic archipelago, so to speak. They were close to the supercontinent known as Proto-Gondwana. Gradually, however, the three continents moved closer together. This process would continue throughout the Silurian to give rise to the future supercontinent Laurasia. On land and at sea, nothing on our planet ever stands still. Everything is in perpetual motion. Change is continuous, and yet we never notice it. It has to be said that change is so slow and takes place over millions of years that it is imperceptible. Yet the upheavals, be they geological, climatic, organic, or evolutionary, are there for all to see. The dance of the continents continues, as you can see. This coming together of the continents will also give rise to a new mountain range, the Caledonian Chain. At the very beginning of this era, the Lapitus Ocean continued to subduct, i.e., an oceanic lithospheric plate slipped beneath an adjacent plate that was advancing in the opposite direction. On the edge of the Laurentia continent, a geological and geographical difference from the Ordovician can be observed. Towards the end of the Ordovician period, a terrain or microcontinent slowly detached from Gondwana and clung, so to speak, to the Laurentia continent. Speaking of Gondwana, have you noticed the ice cap that has settled over the continent? As the climate evolves, this will retreat. As a logical consequence, sea levels rose. Glacial sediments from this period can be found as far away as the Wenlock. Over time, a warmer climate sets in. Sea levels are higher and temperatures milder. All these phenomena had an impact on Silurian flora and fauna. But the big divide between the Ordovician and Silurian periods was the biological crisis that hit our planet so hard. A mass extinction that will lead a large number of species to their doom. The Ordovician period was an aquatic paradise for all species living on our planet. Biodiversity was rich and species thrived and adapted perfectly to their environment. Remember, we spoke in the introduction about a major evolutionary radiation during the Ordovician period. Marine species multiplied by a factor of four. Nautiloids, cephalopod mollusks, and the first coral reefs appeared. This was followed by the biological crisis of the Ordovician Silurian, which is thought to have broken down into two extinction phases separated from each other by an ice age. Indeed, traces of an ice cap have been found extending over what were then the high southern latitudes. During this glacial period, perhaps as a direct consequence of continental drift, cold oxygen-rich water would have spread into areas that had previously been poorly oxygenated. In addition, this glaciation would have led to a drop in sea level of around 100 meters. 
This increase in land area due to lower sea levels will affect the lush fauna of the continental shelves, i.e. the shallow waters bordering the continents and extending into the open sea to within a few hundred kilometers of the coastline. As the ice expands, it withdraws large quantities of water from the oceans, causing a drop in sea level that can be considerable, as was undoubtedly the case at the time. Living organisms adapted to anoxia, i.e. to an environment that was ultimately rather low in oxygen, would not have been able to withstand this change causing their extinction. This period of glaciation eventually came to an end and is thought to have lasted between one and two million years. It's important to point out that although glaciation was a major cause of the extinction, other factors such as changes in sea level, plate tectonics, and variations in atmospheric CO2 concentration also played a role. The end of the Ice Age is not without consequences. Rising sea levels would have caused the expansion of poorly oxygenated warm waters, leading to further extinctions. If this hypothesis is correct, it could explain why the biological crisis affected bottom-dwelling organisms such as brachiopods, echinoderms, and trilobites, as well as pelagic forms such as graptolites and nautiloids. While the biological crisis is significant, scientists estimate that it affected almost 85% of species, it did not extinguish large groups in their entirety. A few specimens persist and manage to survive despite these changes in their respective biotopes. In fact, we're going to meet a number of them on our Silurian journey. Some species in genera have undergone evolutionary radiation, enabling them to pass the Ordovician stage. Before going any further, I think it's important to make a brief aside about mass extinctions. Biological crises such as the Ordovician Silurian have occurred several times in Earth's history. Some are better known than others, such as the Cretaceous extinction of the dinosaurs, but they are far from the only ones. Life underwent five mass extinctions during the Phanerozoic, the eon that stretches from the beginning of the Cambrian, 541 million years ago, to the present day. The two most important crises divide this eon into three eras, the Paleozoic, the Mesozoic, and the Cenozoic. Two mass extinctions occurred during the Paleozoic, at the end of the Ordovician, as just mentioned, and at the end of the Devonian. Contrary to what we sometimes hear, these crises were never brutal. They very often had multiple and combined origins, and these were spread over millions of years. When we talk about mass extinctions, we're talking about major crises. These are the ones we're generally most familiar with, because they have, of course, left their mark on the history of our planet. But that doesn't mean they're the only ones to have occurred. The history of living organisms has been punctuated by less severe crises. In fact, the Silurian had three minor extinctions that can be observed in the ocean. There was the so-called Erevican Crisis 433 million years ago, at the boundary between Landovery and Wenlock, the Mold Crisis at the beginning of the Ludlow, and the Lau Crisis towards the end of the same period. For the first, scientists believe that the sea was anoxic, i.e., that the concentration of oxygen in the water dropped sharply. For the others, it's the ocean level that's mainly to blame. In 30,000 years, sea level would have risen by 16 meters. This is a very rapid change. Too rapid to give the species dependent on the impacted biotopes time to adapt and evolve accordingly. 
To conclude the chapter on geology and geography in the Silurian era, the most important thing to remember is that the Earth underwent considerable changes, notably the melting of the great ice formations, which had major repercussions on the environment and life. These repercussions are sometimes an unavoidable shock for the living world, but are also sometimes synonymous with renewal, diversity, and development. Fauna underwent a great upheaval following the mass extinction at the end of the Ordovician period. It was even fatal for a large number of species. However, other species managed to survive the extinction. This is the case for certain species, such as certain members of the trilobites. After the major biological crisis that hit our oceans, life is finally returning to normal. Of course, this process takes time. Biodiversity has been greatly weakened, and it will take tens of thousands of years to restore the balance. After the crisis, another event will shake things up a bit and give a little boost to the order of living things. A warmer climate will lead to the melting of certain ice caps and higher ocean temperatures. These elements will then be conductive to the development of tabulate corals, hexacoralliarids and tetracoralliarids, as well as algae and stromatophores. On the subject of stromatophores, until a few years ago they were classified as belonging to the order of corals. They were thought to be closely related to the millipore, the hydrocorallia. However, according to the latest findings from fossil analyses of these organisms, they are more likely to be classified as sponges. Each of these species, from corals to algae and sponges, contributes to the construction of large reefs, particularly on intertropical plateaus. We'll soon be taking a closer look at reefs. Let's stay on the surface for a moment. Even today, reefs are teeming with life and form one of the essential pillars of many marine ecosystems. In Silurian times, this was also the case for many organisms. Reefs were home to a large number of species, providing food for other animals higher up the food chain. Speaking of the food chain, there's another element besides the reef that we sometimes forget to mention when we think of ocean ecosystems, plankton. Despite its small size, it's a very important element. The food chain is one of the building blocks of an ecosystem. Everyone has a place and a role to play in this ecosystem. Whether predator or prey, each species counts for the survival of all. Today, as in the Silurian era, the base of the marine food chain is made up of plankton. In fact, during this third Paleozoic era, phytoplankton and zooplankton were already present in the vast ocean. For the record, phytoplankton are all unicellular organisms present in the surface waters of the ocean and using photosynthesis as a source of energy. Zooplankton are animal plankton that feed directly or indirectly on phytoplankton. The Silurian period saw the appearance of Urnochitina, Urna, and Fungochitina, Cosovensis, two marine plankton. In biology, they are known as Chitinozoans. Like all marine species, phytoplankton and zooplankton were severely affected by the biological crisis at the end of the Silurian, but some have survived and even evolved. Until the beginning of the Ordovician period, graptolites belonged to the dendroid group, i.e. organisms with a planktonic lifestyle, but this was no longer the case. After undoubtedly passing through a pseudoplanktonic phase, a few million years later, 
they finally formed a class of colony-dwelling animals belonging to the Hemichordata phylum. Graptolites are rather strange colony-dwelling creatures floating in the water. These small marine organisms are colonial animals gathered around a main stem, with one individual serving as the central base, to which are attached small cells where each specimen lives. A real structure develops around it, forming a sort of living bell suspended in the water. But they can also cling to algae and form their colony around this attachment point if conditions require it for survival. Another important point to remember about graptolites is that they are stratigraphic. In other words, they enable us to situate sedimentary layers in time. The Landovery period saw the appearance of Para, Chidograptus, Achimanatus, and Achidograptus ascensus. During the Wenlock, Cirtograptus centrifugus marks the beginning of the period. This is followed by Neo diversograptus nilsoni in the Ludlow period and Monograptus perultimus in the Prydolian. In 2015, a study carried out on fossil plankton dating back some 415 million years unlocked a number of mysteries, including some of the causes of mass extinction. Paleontologists have also noted a high proportion of malformed, so-called teratological individuals in fossil phytoplankton and zooplankton in sedimentary layers dating from the Ordovician Silurian period. These correspond to the initial stages of extinction events. After analysis, it turns out that these microorganisms contain a form of heavy metal pollution. Today, we know only too well the extent to which heavy metals have a negative impact on plankton. Scientists are well aware of the teratological effects of these metals. Toxins cause morphological abnormalities in aquatic organisms, and the presence of malformed individuals even serves as a tool for detecting possible contamination. Measurements of metal concentrations in some of these fossil specimens, as well as in the rocks surrounding them, reveal high concentrations of iron, lead, and arsenic. The abundance of these heavy metals in the fossils and rocks, combined with a high presence of teratological forms, suggests that the metals were absorbed by the organisms when they were alive and deposited in the surrounding sediments. While not the sole and principal cause of the major extinction, heavy metal pollution remains a contributing factor to the extinction phenomenon. Maybe it's time for us to go and meet some larger marine animals, don't you think? A few mollusks, some brachiopods, and many fish would like to testify to their history. What all these species have in common is the aquatic world. The fauna is almost exclusively marine, and in the end quite similar in all four corners of the globe. Some species settle in coastal regions, other prefer deeper waters. During the Ordovician period, we observed several species of mollusk. This large family continued to evolve during the Silurian. These, like the nautiloids, prefer coastal areas and shallow waters. Thanks to the sunlight penetrating the water, we should be able to see several fine specimens of these small marine organisms. I told you just now that many mollusks continued to evolve after the Ordovician during the Silurian. This means that a small handful did not. Not all nautiloids continued their development after the Ordovician. Giant nautiloids, for example, are less and less present in the Silurian. They survived the Ordovician, 
but during the Wenlock, the second period of the Silurian, they eventually became extinct, as in the case of the Camaraceras genus. Other nautiloids diversified several million years ago, and the climatic and environmental conditions of the Silurian favored their development and diversification. Nautiloids include straight, curved, and even spiral shells. Not only did they survive the Ordovician Crisis, but they also made it through the Cretaceous Crisis unscathed, as the Nautilus and Allonautilus genera still exist today. Nautiloids belong to the tetrabranchial class of cephalopod mollusks, i.e. they have four gills. They live exclusively in open water. Nautiloid cephalopods have a distinctive shell. It spirals in a single plane. Inside there are several compartments, loges separated by partitions. The animal lives in the last compartment called the living chamber. Although the animal only lives in one chamber, the other chambers are still useful. Each of these chambers contains a mixture of water and gas. Our little nautiloid is able to manage the volume of this mixture in the chambers thanks to the siphon that runs through them, allowing it to rise or fall deeper into the water. Most nautiloids are scavengers or opportunistic predators. In other words, they don't play hard to get and take what comes their way. During the previous period, the Ordovician, one nautiloid genus in particular had its heyday, Orthoceras. They were alpha predators, predators at the top of the food chain. But the giant Orthoceras will soon have to learn to be on its guard. Eurypterids made their grand entrance during the Silurian period. Here we see a Eurypterid, Acaturamus. It won't hesitate to attack the giant nautiloid if hunger strikes. But we'll have the chance to meet this new predator of the deep blue later on. In the Silurian, new genera of these cephalopods are also appearing, such as Pismoceras. Their shells are no longer completely planispiral, i.e. spiral-shaped on a single plane. The inner towers are detached from the outer towers, the Phragmoceras genus also boasts a rather singular morphology, with its shell shape like a Phrygian cap. Phragmoceras, Eurystoma, and Phragmoceras dubium can be seen here. Phragmoceras is a nautiloid cephalopod mollusk with a distinctive curved shell in the shape of a Phrygian bonnet, rather than a coiled shell of today's nautilus with almost two openings, one for the head and the other for the siphon. Among cephalopods, Actinoceratidae can also be found with a straight phragmacone. The phragmacone is the equivalent of the ostracum in other mollusks. It forms the partition part of the cephalopod shell. These mollusks have lived alongside other cephalopods, such as Ascoceratitidae, Discoceratidae, Onchoceratidae, and Tarphoceratidae, whose spirally wound phragmacones are capable of floating. They also have a large siphon. Among the Discoracidae, it is interesting to observe one of the members of the genus, Gomphoceras. Unlike the other animals we saw, it too has a rather unusual shape. Most of the animal remains enclosed in the shell, leaving the tentacles and funnel to pass through. Its shape is convex and elongated, rather like a drop of water. Orthoceratidae can also be seen. They have a straight or slightly arched phragmacone. The siphon is narrow and variable in position either straight or ringed. The cephalopods we've just discovered enjoy reefs and life in the shallow waters of our oceans, 
but so do brachiopods. Mollusks may be present, but brachiopods are in the majority and populate the Silurian oceans more widely. In a few million years' time, the balance will tip in the opposite direction. There will be fewer brachiopods and more mollusks during the Devonian. To give you an idea of this reversal, in the seas of the primary era, there were around 50 brachiopods for every bivalve. Today, there are far fewer brachiopods, with an estimated one brachiopod for every 50 bivalves. Brachiopods are marine animals that bear a striking resemblance to bivalves, due to their two-valved shells. Without a little knowledge of the subject, they could easily be confused. In fact, these two groups are quite different in anatomy, and unlike bivalves, brachiopods are not mollusks. They are a group that belongs to the Lophophorians. This group also includes the Bryozoa and Foranidia. Brachiopods are placed in the phylum Lophophorians because it is a phylum of invertebrates that possess a lophophore. A lophophore is a silated apparatus that plays both a feeding and a respiratory role. It is this common characteristic that brings the bryozoans we have mentioned and the brachiopods together in the same class. The Paleozoic is the golden age of brachiopods as it was during this long period that they were the most numerous and diverse. Although we still have many brachiopod specimens in our seas, as we have just mentioned, they remain less numerous than they were millions of years ago. These marine animals have a benthic or sessile lifestyle, which means they live attached to the seabed. To better understand these small animals, it's important to know that a benthic lifestyle means that the organisms live attached to the ground or move by skimming the bottom. They find their food in the sediment and thus depend on it for their sustenance. A sessile lifestyle, on the other hand, defines a lifestyle in which the organism is permanently attached to the substrate, i.e. the soil where it grows or develops. This is the case, for example, of sponges and corals. There are two types of valve articulation, the main criteria for classifying this marine group, articulated brachiopods and inarticulated brachiopods. During the Silurian, articulated brachiopods diversified considerably. Unlike inarticulated brachiopods, the shells of articulated brachiopods remain fused even after the animal has died. Articulation is made possible by the presence of teeth on one valve, the peduncular valve, and dimples of complementary shapes on the other valve. Their two-valve shell is said to be asymmetrical and can be attached to the substrate. The larger valve is called the peduncular or ventral valve. The smaller one is commonly referred to as the dorsal or brachial valve. To attach itself, the brachiopod had a peduncle attached to an orifice called the foramen. At the commissure, the joint between the two shells, we can see a wavy shape running along the edges. It is precisely these small undulations that differentiate brachiopods from bivalves, where the commissure is smooth. Silurian brachiopods include Orthidae, Strophomenidae, Pentameridae, Rhynconellidae, Spiriferidae, and Terbratulidae. The Strophomenidae are an order of articulated brachiopods that live from the Lower Ordovician to the Middle Carboniferous periods. 
they are part of the extinct class of Strophomenata, which was the largest known order of brachiopods, encompassing over 400 genera. All these small marine animals roam a rich seascape that supports the development of biodiversity. As you can see, this landscape is very varied in shallow waters. You can even see some very unusual animals. Sea lilies, also known as crinoids, populate Silurian oceans, as do Scyphocrinites, Elgins. Like sea urchins and starfish, they belong to the echinoderms. They first appeared in the Ordovician period, but expanded greatly in the Silurian. They still exist today. Because of their shape and name, they are often mistaken for sea flowers, but they are really limestone animals, not plants. Take a closer look at Scyphocrinites elgins and you'll see what I mean. It has pinnules at the top of its articulated arms, a kind of small feather that enables it to capture plankton. The arms are grouped together and attached to the central part, the calyx, which itself rests on the stem. At the end of this stem, the sea lily has spikes. These hold it in place on the ground. Other similar animals have found their way to the seabed. Karyocrinites, for example, are also echinoderms, and they are expanding rapidly. Here you can see a Karyocrinites ornatus. These coral reefs have gradually become established, particularly in the Lapidus Ocean, between Protogondwana and Laurasia. They have become the preferred home of the nautiloids we saw, as well as brachiopods. A little further on, we can see the famous Ordovician trilobites, which have diversified considerably since their appearance a few million years ago. For all these little animals, these reefs at the bottom of the ocean could have been like paradise. But that was without counting on the arrival of a larger arthropod, the Eurypterid. Eurypterids are undoubtedly the most emblematic species of the period, and for good reason. The Silurian is known as the golden age of these sea scorpions. You have to imagine that these arthropods can reach absolutely extraordinary sizes, like this Eurypterid, Pteragotus. It is almost two meters long. During the Silurian period, it was the largest predator on the planet. No living organism rivals it in size or power. As a result, it quickly became a formidable predator, rising to the top of the food chain. More than a hundred different species of Eurypterid are thought to have existed. They varied in size, but the largest specimens could reach between 2 meters 50 and 3 meters 60, or between 8 and 12 feet. This group includes Eurypterus, Megalograptus, and Pteragotus, which we have just seen. As we said earlier in our trip, the Eurypterid is a marine arthropod. Morphologically, it resembles a scorpion hence its nickname Sea Scorpion. It is related to arachnids and crustaceans. Although closely related to the scorpion, the horseshoe crabs we still encounter today are their closest cousins. The Eurypterid belongs to the Meristome group, like horseshoe crabs, and not to the arachnid group, like scorpions. The Eurypterid is easy to identify. It can be recognized by its elongated body and large articulated tail. Its sting is visible at the end of the tail. However, unlike the scorpions we know today, it turns out that this sting contained no venom. At least that's what we know today. The Eurypterid also has a pair of fin-like legs and giant sharp pincers 
these are highly efficient at cutting and crushing prey. While some species of this genus were undoubtedly opportunists, feeding on corpses found here and there on the ocean floor, other Eurypterids were fine predators. Their size was an asset, and to reach such dimensions, the environment and living conditions had to be right. At that time, oxygen levels were higher. Experiments have shown that the richer the oxygen content of the aquatic or terrestrial environment, the larger the insects, and in our case, the Eurypterati. As we just mentioned, Eurypterids were among the largest predators of their time and quickly rose to the top of the chain. They hunted trilobites in deep water. Trilobites look a bit like aquatic sow bugs. What applies to Eurypterids in terms of size also applies to trilobites. There were species as small as a few millimeters, but also some very large specimens. Some were as much as 75 centimeters or 30 inches long. So predators adapted to this type of morphology were needed. Their rigid dorsal carapace, rich in calcium carbonate, fossilized easily, hence their abundance in sediments. On the other hand, the underside and appendages are rarely preserved and are known from only a dozen or so species. Eurypterids and trilobites have another thing in common. Like all arthropods, they grew throughout their lives by successive molts. If Eurypterids were formidable predators, it's because they were perfectly equipped to become the greatest marine predators of their time. Many marine animals with tails can only move them horizontally. In sea scorpions, the tail was virtually inflexible horizontally, but highly mobile vertically. According to the researchers, sea scorpions were thus able to bend their tails and project them far onto their targets. They would assault and kill their prey with lateral attacks using their toothed tails. This is what the recent study of a fossilized specimen, that of Slimonia acuminata, has revealed. Eurypterids have been numerous and highly diversified over the years, but they have also evolved. Soon, in the Carboniferous period in particular, Eurypterids such as Adelophthalmus pirae were able to breathe in the open air, whereas until then they had been aquatic specimens. Their shells were also able to withstand atmospheric pressure in the open air. In other words, from time to time they might be able to get onto dry land without any difficulty at all. For now, we're going to continue our journey into the open sea to discover the many other species that inhabit the vast ocean. Yes, we haven't had time to meet any fish yet, but as you'll see, the history of this group during the Silurian period is full of twists and turns. Fish evolved a lot, especially at the end of the Silurian. But let's take a step back to better understand these changes. The first chordate organisms appeared in the Cambrian, it was from this cord that the vertebral column was derived, to which muscles could be attached, giving them greater mobility. During the Ordovician period, organisms such as Sacabambaspis, Arandaspis, and Astraspis developed an exoskeleton. This external carapace protected the anterior part of their body, leaving the posterior part flexible to facilitate movement of their only limb, their tail. They were thus the first craniites to appear. Crania are the clade of animals with a cartilaginous or bony skull 
protecting the anterior part of the nervous system. They belong to the ostracoderms. With no lateral fins, they use only the power of their tails to navigate the ocean floor. The evolution of fish had pretty much come to a halt here at the end of the Ordovician period. Although there were a few outlines of evolution, they were mainly fixed and developed in the Silurian. Several groups of fossil vertebrates with mineralized skeletons but no jaws are known. These groups, also known as ostracoderms, are the Aranidaspids, Astraspids, Heterostracans, Anaspids, Galeaspids, Peturiaspids, Osteostracans, and Thylodonts. Let's take a moment to differentiate some of these major groups in Silurian fishes. First of all, let's review some basic fish vocabulary. Ostracoderm fish are essentially bottom-dwelling fish with massive bony armor. They are also often referred to as agnathans or jawless fish. Agnathans, the jawless fish that appeared discreetly in the Ordovician period, diversified. Alongside the common-shaped anaspids, we find groups with increasingly varied shapes. The dart shape heterostracans, the ray-like osteostracans, and the more pot-bellied telodonts. Let's start with the anapsids. And to discover this group, we're going to look at an exceptional member, Burkinia. It's a little shorter than the others, measuring around 10 centimeters or 4 inches. Like the others, however, it has neither jaws nor fins, it is also distinguished by a complex set of dorsal scales. Anapsids generally have 6 to 25 gills, but the Burkinia genus has 30. This one is a Burkinia elegans. It's probably a filter feeder. Ostracoderms are, so to speak, the most advanced of the agnathans. Although they still have a long way to go, these fish are increasingly well adapted to their environment and equipped to defend themselves against predators. Among the members of the anapsids, the anaspid, Pharyngolepis oblongus stands out. It has no facial shield, but a rather elongated shape with a well-developed anal fin. It measures between 10 and 25 centimeters, 4 and 10 feet. Among the telodonts, we could go and meet the telodont Loganellia scotica, an agnathus measuring around 25 centimeters or 10 feet. It has no scales but plate armor. We can see that it's more paunchy and quite different morphologically from the anapsids, despite their few similarities. Another genus stands out from the others, the heterostracans, Heterostracans have an anterior dermal shield and scales on their body and tail. As you can see, the front of these fish is very pronounced. They are shaped like arrows or horseshoes at the front. Heterostracans are agnathic vertebrates. They can be recognized by their single bone facial shield. This is known as the anterior dermal shield. This no longer grows once the animal reaches adulthood. Another distinctive feature is their flattened body, with a mouth on top of the head and scales covering the body and tail. Their closest relatives today are hagfish. One of the Silurian specimens is the Teraspis. This fish has a double shield of dorsal and ventral plates. It also has a rostrum an elongated appendage that some animals, both vertebrates and invertebrates, can have, such as the saw shark. Although it doesn't really have fins as such, 
The Pteraspis has a lobe tail, a carapace, and a rostrum that make it very aerodynamic underwater. And then if you look a little closer, you'll notice that its carapace has a few wing-like protuberances on the sides, which also enable it to compete with the best Silurian swimmers. The spine you see on the back of its carapace isn't very useful for swimming but it was undoubtedly very useful for warding off predators. Pteraspis' favorite food is plankton. It therefore lived on the surface rather than in the depths. During the Silurian period, there were several species of Pteraspis, including Pteraspis croci and Pteraspis rostrata. One fish bears a close resemblance to Pteraspis, a close cousin so to speak. It's the Rhinoteraspis dunensis. You'll notice that like it, it has a carapace, a rostrum, and defensive spines on its back. Both measure between 20 and 30 centimeters. Earlier, we also mentioned Galeaspids. These fish also belong to the Agnathan group. They are primitive fish that had neither fins nor jaws. One member of the genus is called Shuyu, Jejiengensis. Here is another member of the group, Laxaspis. The distinctive head armor is still recognizable. Our little sojourn with the Agnathans is drawing to a close, but our journey with the fishes is not over yet. Indeed, the evolution of these fish is not the only great revolution concerning them. One of the great events of the Silurian period was the arrival of jawed fish, the Nathostomes. Their jaws were formed from the second branchial arch of Agnathans. The first jawed vertebrates or nathostomes, were the spiny-finned acanthodians and the placoderms, which enclosed the front of their bodies in a bony carapace. The acanthodonian, climatius, reticulatus, was one of the first jawed vertebrates. It is easily distinguished by the small ventral spines that support its fin. Acanthodians are evolutionary unusual in that they combine the characteristics of bony fish, osdecthians, and cartilaginous fish, chondrichthians. During the Ordovician period, the oceans were populated by so-called ostracoderms, armored fish with a dermal bone armor. As we have seen, these fish also belong to the Agnathans, they were still widely present in the Silurian. But at the end of the Ordovician and beginning of the Silurian, the arrival of placoderm fish and above all, nathostome fish, i.e. fish with jaws, completely overturned the marine world. But don't make any wrong assumptions. Jaws do not necessarily mean teeth. The placoderm fish group has undergone two major revolutions. Unlike ostracoderms, they had an articulated armor, mainly on the front of the body, composed of plates reminiscent of turtle shells. The other strong point of these fish is of course their jaws. Their jaws end in bony outgrowths. This type of jaw can also be seen in modern turtles. We'll have to wait a little longer to see real teeth in fish. Nevertheless, this primitive jaw remains powerful and perfectly suited to the task of predation. What's more, even if the teeth haven't fully erupted yet, we can see bony outgrowths that are undoubtedly the first signs of this biological evolution. Placoderms are referred to as nathal plates rather than teeth, with the upper, superagnathal plate resting on the lower, inferagnathal jawbone. 
This set of plates with their occlusal zones acted like scissors. This is particularly true of the fish we're looking at here. Antelognathus primordialis. It has several fins, a long tail, and a very distinctive face. It's the first to display what resembles a face, with its distinctive position of eyes, nose, and mouth. When you observe an ostracoderm, such as the anaspid, pharyngolepis, oblongus, and a placoderm, such as entelognathus, primordialis, you'll notice that there are several other very distinct differences between these two groups of fish. Firstly, the placoderm's armor is no longer only on the head, but all along the body. Scales are also clearly visible. Morphologically, the most striking feature is undoubtedly the presence of fins. These fish have real limbs expressly designed for swimming. This group is therefore undergoing a major evolutionary process. With the appearance of fins, placoderm fish are able to move more precisely, swimming better and faster. Its carapace protects it from other marine animals and above all, it acquires a powerful jaw, capable of defeating its prey, making it a good marine predator. To conclude on the hatching of the nathostomes, it should be noted that this group gave rise some time later to two major groups that we still know today, the cartilaginous fishes and the bony fishes. The analysis of an Entelognathus primordialis fossil turned all our beliefs and knowledge about fish classes and evolutionary theories on their head. Until the discovery of Entelognathus, it was considered that the placoderm skeleton had nothing to do with that of bony fish, and that the two had appeared separately. It was therefore thought that cartilaginous fish, similar to rays and sharks, had given rise to bony fish. But Entelognathus has small cranial bones and jaw bones, Placoderms are therefore the direct ancestors of modern fish. Vertebrates were undoubtedly endowed with a bony skeleton from the start. Indeed, the external dermal bones they possess are similar to those of Ostichthians, so they probably have the same origin. This means that the evolutionary position of sharks has changed dramatically. This revelation refines our knowledge of a whole area of paleobiology. Fossils still have much to teach us. Discoveries such as these shed a little more light on our distant past. Let's leave placoderms for a completely different kind of fish. Even if they don't belong, to the nathostomes per se, it would be interesting to meet some conodonts. These very special fish certainly have a lot to teach us and help us discover. The genus Wormelia, for example, particularly Wormelia inflata, was present in the oceans of the Paleozoic era. These animals are rather difficult to describe and rather unusual, even frightening despite their small size. They don't have jaws, yet they have small teeth. It may seem paradoxical, but they're not the only animals to have teeth but no jaws. This is the case of hagfish and lampreys, for example. Hagfish are necrophagous and lampreys parasitic. A 2012 study published in Proceedings of the Royal Society B shed some light on this animal, which is certainly a vertebrate and its mode of nutrition since it possessed a rather original teething system. According to the study, the scientists, a group of British and Australians, were able to uncover, through toothwear, 
the workings of their distinctive dentition. Teeth functioned in pairs, one opposite the other, exerting rotational movements to crush food. Finally, the absence of jaws prevented these fish from exerting strong pressure, but they managed to compensate for the problem with very sharp teeth. After all these marine encounters, we can affirm that even if the Silurian is a short period, it was marked by numerous events and major biological evolutions in the marine world. Marine biodiversity developed and enriched considerably during the Silurian. But what about on land? Terrestrial life is limited to a narrow band of wetlands around rivers and lagoons, but even if it's still limited, it's there. Both fragile and firmly rooted in the soil, it is determined to conquer dry land. But as you can imagine, it didn't all happen in a day. It took several million years to reach the narrow, wet, life-rich Silurian strip of land. After the evolutionary radiation of the Cambrian, also known as the Cambrian Explosion, so important was the development of life, and after the Ordovician radiation, which was also very rich and important, the arrival of the first arthropods on Earth is without doubt the most important revolution in the history of life on Earth. It is symbolic. It marks the beginning of all possibilities. Plants were the first to colonize terra firma. As early as the Ordovician period, 470 million years ago, fundamentally altering the geosphere. Oxygenation of the atmosphere, formation of soils, and new climatic and sedimentary regimes. Until then, however, plants were virtually alone in the world. However, mycorrhizae, symbiotic associations between plant roots and soil fungi, not only give plants better access to soil nutrients, but also help to weather the rock. In other words, together they pave the way for a biotope worthy of the name. When arthropods finally land on the continent, they bring with them the very first terrestrial ecosystem. Arthropods were the first animals to take the plunge, along with myriapods and arachnids in the Silurian 430 million years ago. They opened the door to the hexapods, the insects, which in turn landed on land at the beginning of the Devonian, as well as to other animals straight out of the water. In all, seven arthropod groups independently reached land, myriapods, arachnids, hexapods, and at least four crustacean groups, including sow bugs and crabs. Vertebrates were therefore the last to colonize continental environments, only at the end of the Devonian. In fact, vertebrates could not have left the water as quickly as arthropods, for the simple reason that the latter were better equipped to cope with the many anatomical and physiological problems of life on land. Arthropods will play an essential role in soil development and the decomposition and recycling of nutrients. To better understand this very first ecosystem, let's go back a few million years to observe the beginnings of the very first plant cover. The oldest fossils of land plants date back to the beginning of the Middle Ordovician period, some 470 million years ago. We're going to find part of the fossil of these first plants, their spores. While the lack of complete fossils limits our knowledge of these early plants, it does enable us to date their appearance. A little later in the Silurian, we began to find fossils of a different kind, this time, we can analyze fossil remains of plant stems and roots from around 430 million years ago. 
these fossils include the first vascular plants, also known as tracheophytes, which transport water and mineral salts throughout the plant. Vascular plants, which produce more acids than algae or lichens and have a much more developed root system, offer a larger contact surface. It is therefore highly likely that they have intensified alteration of the substrate, i.e. the soil in which they grow. With these first plants, the earth was able to welcome its new inhabitants. Numerous morphological and physiological transformations were required in both plants and animals before living organisms could adapt to life on land. While the aquatic world is not always the most peaceful, life on the surface is harsh and much more unstable. Arthropods, thanks to their rigid shells, have been able to overcome the first difficulty posed by atmospheric pressure on a body, a difficulty that until now was not so problematic since the organisms lived in water. Another problem faced by the Earth's first settlers was reproduction out of water. In the early days, animals living on land still reproduced in an aquatic environment. It wasn't until a few further evolutions, and above all major biological revolutions such as the amniotic egg, that this obstacle was overcome. But we're not there yet. Far from it. Plants first tried to conquer new territories, gradually establishing themselves on the continent during the Silurian period. In previous eras, green algae, cyanobacteria, and lichens had gradually settled on land. Until then, only lichen had managed to make a real place for itself. But in the early Silurian, moss also managed to establish itself. Despite the light presence of this vegetation on the Earth's surface, the landscape remains close to desolation. It's a far cry from a lush forest. However, something is about to change during the Silurian period. Water brought sediments to the coasts, and these sediments were a godsend for certain plants that could cling to the ground while taking advantage of the nearby water. This is how Cooksonia hatches, a plant with a stem and a kind of ball at its tip. Its average height is 10 centimeters or 4 feet. But this height is enough for Cooksonia to spread its spores through the air and reproduce. Soon, Cooksonia is carpeting coastal landscapes. Cooksonia thrives but still encounters some adaptation difficulties until now, plants didn't have to withstand atmospheric pressure, or at least, through water, they could withstand it much more easily. In the course of evolution, they adopted a new skeleton, better suited to life on land. During the Middle Silurian, another major evolution took place in these plants. They were equipped with stomata, small orifices that enabled them to breathe through the air. In this way, plants will acquire new abilities to adapt to their new environment. In water, nutrients were more readily available. On land, they are faced with rock. To overcome this problem, they acquire rhizomes. These are the beginnings, so to speak, of roots. Thanks to these, they can absorb nutrients from the soil and above all, redistribute them, even to the plant's highest organs, it was not until a few million years later that plants completed their panoply with outgrowths. These will enable them to capture more of the sun's rays and thus grow. For each plant to succeed, it sometimes had to climb much higher than the others. At that time, ferns were much larger than those we know today, for example. Even if vegetation was still very limited in the Silurian, 
it still helped new species to flourish. On land, there are indeed some plant species, but also animals that are just beginning their journey on Earth. In the Silurian, vegetation was still in its infancy, but this was enough for myriapods and arachnids such as mites, spiders and scorpions to adapt to a terrestrial environment. Arachnids form a class of animals that is often confused with and limited to spiders. Although spiders are indeed part of this class, they are not the only members. This class also includes scorpions, mites, ticks, and opilions. What distinguishes this group is that its members have four pairs of legs, neither wings nor antennae, and their ocelli or eyes are simple rather than compound, as in dragonflies, for example. Arachnids are also arthropods, i.e. they have a segmented body, and are more specifically chelicerol arthropods. They have chelicerae. These chelicerae are appendages close to the mouth that end in hooks or pincers. If you've been paying attention during our trip, this description probably reminds you of our famous Eurypterids. You're quite right to make the connection, as they are both chelicerol arthropods. The arachnid order is included in the class of these chelicerol arthropods. Eurypterids are also included, as they too have mouth-like appendages that end in hooks or pincers. Unlike our first encounter with Eurypterids, this time we're not looking for members of these chelicerol arthropods in the water, but on land. With the help of vegetation, spiders, scorpions, and even myriapods have managed to make a little space for themselves. As you probably know by now, the first clawed arthropods of the Chelicerae suborder appeared around 540 million years ago during the Cambrian, the oldest period of the Paleozoic era, most adapted to life on land. But during the Silurian period, the first scorpions and spiders settled on the continent, or at least left a trace of their passage on Earth. Yes, let's not forget that distant history is a very special science. Scientists rely on current knowledge, technology, and of course, first and foremost, on fossils. Unfortunately, it's not always possible to find remnants of the distant past. Based on analysis of the elements currently in our possession, it appears that the first scorpions and spiders on the continent date back to the Silurian. However, future discoveries may update or refine this information. Among Silurian arachnids, the scorpion genus and the spider genus in particular are found on Earth. Earlier we met a sea scorpion, this time it's a land scorpion, Paleophonus. The scorpion is about 7 centimeters long. Yes, larger plants in newly enriched soils are enriching biodiversity we can see spiders, scorpions, and myriapods. Paleophonus, our scorpion, has a way of life that still raises questions. He lived on Earth, that's a fact. At least that's what the fossil evidence suggests. Now whether it was exclusively terrestrial, mainly aquatic and on dry land at times, or aquatic in its juvenile form and then terrestrial as an adult, the question remains unanswered. The sting at the end of its tail, also called telson, is undoubtedly venomous, unlike the Eurypterids we've seen. In the spider, there are clear similarities and differences with the scorpion. In the scorpion, the abdomen extends into a post-abdomen called the tail. In the spider, the body is composed of two parts, 
but the head and thorax are combined into a single part, called the cephalothorax. The second part is the abdomen. It is on the cephalothorax that we find the four pairs of locomotive legs and the chelicerae. While the finest fossil specimens date from the Devonian, Paleocarinus rhinensis lived on Earth at the end of the Silurian. It belongs to the order Triganotarbida. Spiders of the order Triganotarbidae do not yet have silk producing spinnerets, unlike the majority of predatory spiders today. Examples include Cryptomartis, Brebski, Pneumodesmus also lived on Earth at the same time. This time we're dealing with a myriapod. It is undoubtedly the first of this group to take its first steps on the continent. This ancestor of millipedes marks an important stage in the conquest of the terrestrial environment by arthropods, as it is the oldest terrestrial animal discovered to exhibit typical air breathing. The opening of the trachea is visible on the fossil segments found, suggesting a terrestrial life. It would then be necessary to wait patiently for biological evolution to continue before other organisms manage to live on the continent. To conclude our journey into the Silurian, it's worth remembering that this was a transitional period between the Ordovician and Devonian eras. It was a period when plants and certain arthropods finally succeeded in conquering the land but also when primitive fish made their grand entrance among aquatic animals. Primitive fish that would later give rise to a major revolution in the world of life. The Acanthodians gave rise to the Osteichthians or bony fish, which in turn gave rise to the Sarcopterygians. These in turn gave rise to the Crossopterygians all these groups may not mean much to you, as they're pretty hard names to remember. But you should know that during the Devonian period, the Crossopterygians gave rise to the first tetrapods, which you may be more familiar with, since this large group includes, for example, dinosaurs and birds, amphibians, reptiles, and mammals. But that's another period another story, another journey through time.